Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And today I read an article that was in the Telegraph, which is located in the UK. And it said that the banks are considering abandoning their costly contracts for disaster recovery sites in order to find more ways to save money. Again, it illustrates that the product offering by Ripple is now more attractive than ever as the technology and the digital asset XRP puts more working capital in their pockets. And you can hear in the words of Monica Long, she is the senior vice president of marketing at Ripple. From this podcast, uh, she explains the two advantages that are realized with RippleNet technology and XRP. Just have a listen. It is only about 45 seconds long. Uh so there's a couple different elements to the, the types of solutions we provide. One is um, making the, the process of messaging and settlement more transparent, more efficient, uh, lower cost end to end. Um, and that's with, you know, fiat trades or um, the other kind of key problem. The reason that there's so much friction with global payments is the way liquidity is provided. Um, it's pretty, uh, uh, it's pretty uh, controlled by very few large institutions like the cities and HSBCs of the world. Um, and, you know, we all appreciate one of the revolutions with crypto is creating open marketplaces and, and you know, the ability for kind of greater democratization of, um, of trading. Yeah, so the lower cost, of course, end to end with those fiat trades, very, very important. And then the liquidity aspect, you have this greater democratization of trading. I think this is one aspect that is not often talked about, but it is so important. That's why you see a whole new face in this space. And I'm talking about the neo banks and the payment service providers that gosh, can even create a business from a virtual office, as we saw from the new Ripple net user who is located in Hong Kong. So for the users, they're not left out either. The savings is being passed on. And here we can see that on Saturday, ZenPay and Ripple partnered to waive transaction fees to help ease the impact of our global situation for the key workers in the UK. This is zero fee transfers. Not possible with legacy systems. It's only possible to do with the RippleNet technology. So then you take these near zero and negative interest rates. It's hitting the bank's earnings and it squeezes that gap between the money that they make on loans and also what they pay savings. And so if you're a saver, uh, there's virtually no interest in this space. In Japan, yeah, it's quite affordable to borrow with basically a rate at zero, but the ATM fees are crazy high. And they're also uh, targeting the inactive accounts for maintenance fees. Well, in steps, Wietse Wind from the Netherlands with his team of developers. This is an article that's about the Sum app. It was recently launched in a beta form by the uh, XRPL Labs, which is what his group is called. And it's, gosh, more interesting than ever. It lets the user be their own bank. And as Ripple's Warren Paul Anderson says, Sum is much more than a typical crypto wallet. He goes on to say that this is not an ordinary crypto wallet for XRP, but to the trained eye, Sum provides a host of features and functionality that make it more powerful platform, makes it a more powerful platform for thousands of its individual users to be their own banks. So the ultimate goal of some is to give people a way to save and spend dollars, euros, XRP, and other currencies without the need of assistance from a financial institution. And of course, it's built 
into that XRP ledgers. And the users will be able to add uh, other currencies, including fiat, like US dollars and euros. So on the XRP ledger, there are what's called issued currencies, which represent the value held by the entities outside of the XRP ledger. This is really something, it's perfect timing, Witsa, and there are just so many big changes. And for developers right now, they are key and there is need for innovation with the world that is seemingly never going to go back like it was just a few months ago. So in Japan, there was that focus that came from Chie Ito. She is the founder of this lab called Fino Lab, and it's Tokyo's first incubator space. It is the home for startups, which opened its door in 2016. Chie was really impressed by her visit to the FinTech incubator in London. It's very famous, it's called Level 39, and that was back in 2014. You can see a picture here of what that space looks like. She even put in a, a London red telephone booth. I love it. Anyway, it's a really great space in the heart of the business district in Tokyo. And who is taking up residence there? Well, Coinbase. Yeah, they joined the um, Japan Cryptocurrency Trading Association in March, and it looks like they're getting very close to launching here. You can see the open positions in Tokyo are um, in accounting, legal, and marketing. So I'm really curious to see their influence uh, in the exchanges here in Japan because it's going to be I do believe the first, yeah, the first exchange that really gives a flavor from the West. It'll be very, very interesting. All right. And Mr. Kitao of SBI, he has his own TV show. I think a lot of you might remember I have featured this before, but for those of you who are new to this space, SBI has a significant stake in Ripple and this is the 32nd episode of Mr. Kitao's program, which aired this last weekend, and it's available to watch on YouTube. I'll put a link to it. His guest was uh, Keisuke Furuta, and he's the founder of a company that actually received an investment from SBI, and the company is called Peike. And if you ever come to Japan, this is an app that you might check out. It is something that's available to download for your phone and then just by simply scanning the barcode on a product for sale in Japan, it translates into multiple languages, yeah, including English. And the most critical issue for inbound tourists to Japan is the language barrier. You'd be surprised how little English is spoken and for that matter, can't even be spoken, even if you try. So the consumers from overseas, of course, can't read Japanese. And then if you buy products, you wanna know what is this product used for? What are the ingredients and where is it made? For example, are some really important aspects to shopping here. And one of the most popular items from Japan for visitors, especially from Thailand, Taiwan, and Korea, is this chocola BB. It's a vitamin B2 drink, or sometimes in this um, tablet form, which uh, metabolizes fat. So it's very popular with the young girls. And then it converts that into energy. And it has other ingredients like royal jelly, jelly and amino acids. So it's really one of these uh, health drinks. And it uh, is kind of expensive, but people swear by it. So if you thought we were in the fluff, yeah, we have now moved into the fluff. And the other thing you're going to see when you come to Japan is you'll be surprised how many Maseratis there are. 
This is a car that I didn't see very often when I lived in the United States, but this car maker is so popular in Japan. And this month, a tremendous amount of coverage is being given to the new MC20 super sports car. Look at this really zany camouflage design. And the most interesting part, I think, is that it was dedicated to Sterling Moss, Sir Sterling Moss. He was a British Formula One racing driver, and he won 212 of his 529 races across several categories, but he's described as the greatest driver ever, but one that never won a world championship. So he just passed away in April at the age of 90, and I think he was a real gentleman. Everybody likes a good race. Yeah, even in Japan, we like a good race. And one of the oldest races found is a horse race. And for the first time in more than 900 years, the great festival in Kyoto, Aoi, didn't take place. And it affected the running of this horse race that takes place at the Kamigano, Kamigamo Shrine. It's a festival that's considered one of the top three greats in Japan. And for a country that has hundreds of festivals, that's saying something. So May is the month that it usually takes place, I think because it's one of the best weather months of the year. And this festival, it's just so sad to see that it had to miss its um, whole event this year. And it's something you want to put maybe on your places to visit if you come in May. It takes place in Kyoto. And the location where the festival is held actually began there in the year 544. <laughs> it's registered as a World Cultural Heritage Site, and that was done in 1994. And I found this really great site that has a beautiful photo gallery. And if you're interested in taking a peek, uh, I think the photos are quite beautiful. There's 5,000 participants that dress in this Heian period style of clothing, which is really colorful and steeped in tradition. It's fascinating. All right, everybody, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.